Hello, I'm uh, Nigel Mumford. I'm the director of Christ the King uh, Healing Center at the Oratory of Christ the Healer here in Greenwich, upstate New York. I've had an amazing life. Um, I'm not gonna say when I was born, but uh, it's been an amazing time, an amazing life. The, I was a Marine, I was in the Royal Marines, I was a drill instructor. I uh, used to make grown men cry as a drill instructor. I still make them cry as a priest, but for other reasons. I joined the Marines in the early 70s and spent a year of my life in combat. I've seen extreme violence in, bat in the battlefield. And uh, I've been shot at three times myself, was wounded once in the head, and I was uh, blown up five times. And I've seen man's inhumanity to man. As a teenager, my parents ran a home called um, the Sue Ryder Home, and it was for Polish concentration camp survivors. And at 16, I got to meet a lot of people who uh, were uh, in Auschwitz and Birkenwald and various uh, concentration camps. And many had tattoos on their arms. And I was astonished at, again at man's inhumanity to man. And I think that was a setup really for, for the healing ministry of, of learning about compassion and the issues that people go through physically, emotionally, mentally in life in the area of physical healing, emotional healing and mental healing. I'm uh, from Plymouth in the west country of England, in, in Devon. I was born and educated in the United Kingdom. I've been in America for over 30 years now. And um, <clears throat> being from Plymouth, where the Mayflower set sail from, I feel a bit like a modern day pilgrim uh, coming from Plymouth. And also uh, tell people that I have a photograph of the Mayflower leaving England. And a lot of people believe me, but of course photography was not invented at that time. But I do have a photo of Mayflower too, leaving, leaving England. I've had an incredible life and I'm very blessed to be alive. I've actually had 12 near-death experiences, which is amazing. Agnes Sanford talks about near-death and uh, in her book, The Healing Light. And I believe, um, sh she says that people who've had a near-death experience often have gifts of healing. But I do find it amazing in my life how the Lord has brought that about particularly from being a drill instructor to be involved in combat and then to be involved in a different type of combat in the healing ministry. My first inkling of this ministry came um, after I'd left the Marines and, and had uh, the f several near-death experiences in the service, particularly one, uh, a scuba diving accident when I drowned um, <clears throat> and was in hospital for three days. I was fished out of the water, resuscitated and uh, was very lucky to be alive uh, in a scuba diving accident where something went very wrong at 70 feet. So I'm blessed to be alive at that point in 1975. But my sister Julie, um, this is really where it becomes very interesting. My sister Julie Sheldon was a ballet dancer with the Royal Ballet. And um, she contracted a disease. Well, she, she started off with having issues with her left knee. It clicked and then it froze. Um, she had what's called arthroscopic surgery. And after that surgery, after her leg was frozen, uh, the leg curled up to the point where her left ankle was touching her right buttock. She couldn't walk, let alone dance. And uh, for six months, Julie was told, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, go home to your kids. It's psychological, it's hysterical. So um, very frustrating. But after six months, Julie was given what's called manipulation under anesthetic. She was given a generalized anesthetic and uh, the leg remained straight, excuse me, the leg remained bent. Um, and the doctors forced the leg straight and put a plaster of Paris over the leg to keep it straight. Uh, a couple of hours after the manipulation under anesthetic, the leg went into spasm and broke the plaster of Paris. To imagine the strength of, of the leg to be able to do that is amazing. Why the tendons didn't rip out, the muscles didn't rip, or the bone didn't break, we don't know. But she actually managed to crack the plaster of Paris, to break it. She screamed, passed out. Um, they took the, pl the plaster of Paris off immediately, and the leg went back to the position of being bent up to the buttock. Anyway, she um, was then diagnosed with a disease called dystonia. Dystonia generally is in one place, perhaps it's in the neck where a head is twisted around. You can have it right as dystonia, you can have dysphonia in, in the throat uh, where um, there are issues of speaking. But Julie then was diagnosed with dystonia and it then traveled from her left knee to the right knee to every muscle in her body. She was completely dystonic and eight to ten times a day over a period of three years, everything would reverse with such 
force. Such violence that the, the diagnosis was death by breaking her own neck. It was pretty graphic. Um, I went to see her several times, um, and the last time I saw her, I knew that was it. I knew I was saying goodbye. She had lost 50, um, gosh, she was down to 90, 90 pounds. She had lost a lot of weight. She was very close to death with these violent spasms, which I witnessed a couple of them, where nurses came uh, to minister to help her not to break anything. Um, I said goodbye to Julie, um, knowing that I'd be coming back to England for her funeral. And I walked around the streets of London weeping, just lost, a lost soul. And funny how God works, because he'd led me to a bookshop, W.H. Uh, Smith's in London, and uh, there was a book about the Marines. I opened it up and I opened the book and there was a photograph of me that I didn't know had been taken, let alone published. And I'm off, jumping off the death slide, or as they call it in America, the zip line. And I'm flying down the zip line, holding on uh, to the rope. And not realizing that here was I in a photograph on a zip line and Julie, a couple of blocks away, was in, on her own death slide. Didn't realize that, didn't put that together for a long time. But here's the thing, the next day this man Canon Jim Glennon, an incredible man from Australia, came and prayed for Julie. He laid hands on her. He took on to believe for her healing. He touched her and said, I believe for you. He said, even when we are too weak to have any faith left, Christ is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And he was right there with her, and he believed. The next day, uh, Julie was able to get out of bed and hop to the window, and all the muscles started just, just relaxing and coming back to normal. Physically, her entire healing uh, was extraordinary how that took place. The emotional healing took a bit longer. She had to forgive. And I think that came when um, she was praying with a friend. It was interesting because her left fist remained in a fist. And when you think of unforgiveness, you know, you think of a fist. Or as Lucy said in Peanuts, I'll give you five good reasons not to forgive, you know. But her hand remained in a fist. And one day she was praying at an apple tree. Uh, in, her, uh, in her house, and she was praying with a friend, God, help me to forgive, help me, help me, help me to forgive, and her hand flew open. And that was the end of the dystonia. She was completely free. Absolute miracle. Dystonia is very similar to Parkinson's disease. The basal ganglia has a lesion on it, and it sends the wrong messages to the body, similar to Parkinson's. And in her case, she was not only healed of dystonia, but was cured. So Ken and Jim Glennon became a very close friend. He became my mentor for about 16 years. I'd talk to him about monthly, um, about the healing ministry, and he would learn or teach me uh, information about the healing ministry, of which there's a lot to learn. It was amazing because he died on the day I was ordained. To have your mentor die on the very day of ordination was extraordinary. He had written me a letter passing on the baton of healing to me and my generation. And one day I pray I will do the same, be able to pass this on to somebody else. So after Julie's healing, about a year after, I was in my picture frame shop in Wilton, Connecticut, in the United States. And I was just having a ho-hum day, and this woman walked into the shop, and she actually looked green. Her face looked green. And I said, are you okay? She said, no, I've got a really bad headache. Now, here's the thing. She just told me she had a bad headache. I'd, I would, we'd finish the sale, and I was standing in front of her, and I watched my hands go like this. It was not a conscious effort. It was as if somebody grabbed hold of my hands. I watched my hands do this, and I put them on her head. It was not a conscious effort. I don't recommend going around doing this. She could have sued me, slapped me, called the police. But I put my hands on her head, and she said, right, looked me right in the eyes and said, what did you do? The pain has gone. And that terrified me, because I knew I hadn't done anything, but I knew God had. And I think that was a holy setup to really understand what this ministry is about. I am not a healer, God is the healer. Of this I have no doubt. I know that Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever and that he still heals today, I know that. I'm absolutely convinced about that. And that was in, uh, that was gosh, 31 years ago now when that happened. Uh, sorry, uh, 21 years ago when that happened. And my life changed in an instant, in a blink of an eye. And in that little village of Wilton, people would come monthly to start with and then weekly and then daily people would come in. And my frame shop crew got really upset because there were more people coming in for healing than there were for, for framing, you know. And, and I'd take people down the basement and we'd pray for them. And 
miraculously, people seemed to get better. It was not in my game plan, but God's plan was, was such that he took a Marine who had witnessed combat, a Marine who's been so close to death many times, and has changed me into a priest. It's quite extraordinary, let alone a drill instructor. You know, it was my job to scream and shout at people. You can't do that. Uh, yeah, you know, definitely not as a priest, it doesn't go down too well. But to watch God at work has been an incredible privilege in my life to witness that. When I was in the Marines, we traveled to many, many countries. Prince Charles was with us in, in one of the three month trips to America. And um, he uh, was my helicopter pilot and we used to fly around in his, his aircraft, which is great fun. But I came to the States and really enjoyed coming here. Um, something in me changed. And I came, uh, emigrated to the United States before my sister was sick. She got very sick um, when we were running the business. And then life changed dramatically because of all these people coming in. There came a point in my life when I knew that God was calling me to the healing ministry. It became very obvious. It was a no-brainer, as they say. And um, <clears throat> I found myself uh, meeting people who would just show up. I've never done anything to promote this. This is probably the first time in 21 years to, to really talk about it in such a fashion. But to witness God at work in others has been a real privilege. And people would show up with all sorts of issues, eyesight, hearing, cancer, you name it. And, and God does a mighty work. When we pray, you know, something always happens. And that's extraordinary to witness. So I moved from uh, Connecticut uh, to upstate Connecticut, where we ran a home for healing, uh, the Oratory of the Little Way in Kent, Connecticut. And uh, that was amazing because there was a point in my life where I was trying to rationalize what to do. And I'd sold my business and uh, I was really praying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I realized, witnessing my sister's healing, that I came to a point in my life where I was dedicating my life to the healing ministry to help others because of her healing dedicated my life to the ministry. And I'd moved into this uh, facility that um, was empty at the time. Uh, they were thinking of selling the oratory and I went in and started a healing ministry there. And I'd given up a year of my life to see if God really wanted me to do this. I sort of put a year aside. And many, many things happened during that year and it became very obvious that this is what the Lord was calling me to do. There was a moment I shall never forget. I didn't have a refrigerator. I had one of those little college campus refrigerators. It wasn't big enough. Somebody gave me a full-size refrigerator. People would give me food. One day I opened the fridge and the shelf buckled and stuff fell out, milk, jello, stuff food people had given me, fell on the floor. And I had this great revelation as I laughed. Most people wouldn't laugh when you get a mess on the kitchen floor. I laughed because I realized my cup hadn't overflowed, as it says in Psalm 23, but my refrigerator had overflowed. And it was a great revelation, really, of, of, gosh, yes, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. And since then, so many things have happened. One of the biggest things um, we've sort of specialised in is, is uh, the Welcome Home Initiative, a programme for combat veterans, mainly because of my experience in, in combat and my experience of post-traumatic stress or um, uh, shell shock as it was called in the 70s. I was hospitalized with that. I was a mess. But I sit before you and proclaim that God still heals and has healed me of post-traumatic stress. I still have a, a slight strain of it, if you like, perhaps less than 1%, but it's still there. I don't like people coming up behind me. I don't sit in a restaurant. Uh, I only sit in a restaurant looking at the door. I will never have my back to the door. Little quirks, I guess. But basically to know that the Lord is um, still in the business of healing, if you like. Christ, again, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and still heals. To, to witness all of this, again, has been an extraordinary experience of life. I've written three books on healing, um, Hand to Hand, From Combat to Healing, The Forgotten Touch, and my latest book, which is called After the Trauma, the Battle Begins, a book on post-traumatic stress. And... In writing a book, it's very cathartic, it's very helpful in one's own perspective of life. And I've really thoroughly enjoyed doing that. The Welcome Home Initiative has changed my life. What a privilege it is to watch God at work healing veterans of such trauma. And, you know, people ask me, Nigel, 
what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? I say, mate, I don't know my five-minute plan with God, with a boss like God. You, you've no idea what he's going to do. And uh, for, for example, um, a couple of years ago, I had the privilege of speaking at the Pentagon in Washington to talk about Jesus for an hour and a half, to talk about healing ministry. It was amazing. To meet with uh, the Lord Richard Dannett, um, the former chief of staff of the British Army, to talk about issues of trauma with him. He incidentally wrote the foreword of my book on trauma. Fantastic. Recently, I spent a day at Paris Island, the Marine, US Marine Corps uh, training camp, and, and met with drill instructors and chaplains. And there's been a favor in, in that area to help combat veterans and to watch them being healed. What a privilege. Now, here's the thing. In 20 years of watching people getting healed and then suddenly getting very sick yourself, changed my outlook from a very profound way. It's all very well watching God at work with others, but when you're healed, something happens. Something huge happens. So in October, it was October the 10th, actually, 2009, my life changed very dramatically. I'd been in England. I'd been doing a Welcome Home initiative in England for the Air Force, for the Royal Air Force. That's where I met uh, General, the Lord Richard Dannett. And I had started coughing, not knowing what was wrong with me. I came back to, to America. I'd taught a program uh, in um, Florida on post-traumatic stress, which was filmed for the School of Healing Prayer, actually, with the McNutts. And I couldn't stop coughing. I managed to fly back to the States, I'd fly back home, actually, from Florida. And this cough was getting really out of hand. And the, the day after I flew back from Florida, um, it was about three in the morning, and I said to my wife, I think I need to go to the hospital, there's something not right. I just couldn't stop coughing. Went to the hospital, the emergency room, they gave me a puffer, they said I had adult onset uh, um, asthma. We left the hospital uh, after a breathing treatment, went and had breakfast, came home, and then collapsed with respiratory arrest. That was very frightening. I'd actually used the puffer, couldn't breathe. And my wife, of course, called an ambulance. The next thing I knew, I was being taken back to the hospital. Over the next week, the coughing was so bad, I was put into an induced coma. I remember saying goodbye to my wife and saying I'm very frightened. That's the last thing I remember. Three hours later, I woke up. But it was actually three weeks later. I'd been in a coma for three weeks. I was told then that I'd had contracted H1N1, the swine flu. And when I woke up, all I could move was my right index finger. My entire body was paralyzed, and all I could do was that. And people were talking to me. They were coming in and out of me in this drug-induced, um, the after effects, the aftermath of, of the coma. And very frightening, because I didn't know what was going on. I, I wasn't aware of what was happening. And um, the fear was extraordinary. But then the dreams started to be remembered, really. I had a lot of visions and a lot of dreams whilst I was in a coma. Um, some were amazing, some were frightening. I went to heaven in one of my dreams. I floated off this earth in another one. I was in a sort of position just floating away from the earth. I couldn't see the earth. I was just floating and the stars were so bright. And then I saw the book of life. It was extraordinary. I saw a book in the heavens. It was about a mile wide, about six miles high, and there were lights in it. And as I saw this vision, the pages turned, and the breeze from the pages, I could feel the breeze from the pages as they came by me. But as I looked, I knew I was being introduced to the whole company of heaven. I knew that I knew everybody was being introduced. Their name wasn't in front of that little light or that little star, but I knew who they were. I knew their history just by a sense of knowing. And it was as if I was introduced to the whole company of heaven. It was incredible. It really was. And I've met so many people, I sort of recognize, I sort of know uh, when they're in the book, uh, or perhaps not because they don't worship God. But that was an extraordinary vision. Another one was my house. I saw my house in heaven. It started off with a tulip, uh, as if it was a, a camera on a tulip, and it panned back to see my house. The, by the way, the tulip was so red, so beautiful. Each blade of grass was de defined. Everything was vivid, vivid color, technicolor, you know, wonderful. And there was my house. It wasn't a regular house built this way. It was a house built in diamond f pattern. It was glass, it was all made of glass. The edging was fire engine red, a vivid red. 
It was number eight. There was an eight on the, on the side. It was kind of on its side, like infinity, the number of infinity. It was not until later that I knew, found out that I was in room number eight, ICU, for three months, room number eight. Amazing, I didn't know that. But in my dream, I saw it. But here's, here's the thing. This house was glass, and ladies, there are no kitchens in heaven. You don't need a kitchen because there's living water. You feed on the living water, which is the best thing I've ever tasted in my life. It was amazing. And the water actually ran through my house. And there were, in each room, there was a section where there was a gold chain and a gold cup, and he scooped out this living water, which tasted so fantastic. It really was. Another dream I had was of um, the valley of the shadow of death. Now, this was just so profound. The, there was a sort of semi-circular, well-worn path, slightly fluid, slightly slippery. But I was, I, was on, I, was, I was on the floor and I was moving my arms. It was as if somehow I knew I was paralyzed. Don't know how that happened. But in the vision, I was crawling along the valley of the shadow of death, slightly downhill. But there was no way out. The, the, the rocks either side were very sharp and jagged, no way out. But as I looked, I looked up and I saw Jesus on the cross. I saw him looking at me, his head was down. He didn't speak, but I saw his eyes as if his eyes were encouraging me along. And then I looked a bit further when I got past him. I looked up again, and there he was on the, on the other side. This tableau kept, kept leading the way down the valley of the shadow of death. It was absolutely amazing. Very peaceful, very calm. There's no fear, no worry. There was one disturbing dream where I saw my coffin, and, and I believe that... Uh, my funeral was, was taking place. That was a bit frightening. Um, and I had some activity where they were trying to put me out. And I, then I realized perhaps that was the time when I had the trach. That was a bit uncomfortable. So I woke up, I had a trach, I had both lungs punctured, had a feeding tube, and I lost 53 pounds. That's a lot of weight. I've written an article for the Diocese of Albany that said how I lost 53 pounds on the swine flu diet. Some people have said, you know, well, I said, I don't eat bacon anymore. And people have said, you should eat more bacon. You should get your revenge. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so I have a new understanding for people who've had uh, chronic disease and near-death experiences. There were so many dreams, so many visions, so, so powerful, um, so extraordinary. Many of the hospital staff would come and talk to me because they wanted to know about the H1N1 virus. And many went obviously and had, uh, were inoculated. But after three months being horizontal, uh, to sit up, I threw up every time, to, to readjust my ears that were used to lying down, to stand up was amazing. To be able, I had to learn how to walk again. I had no muscle tone. And the rehab um, OTs were amazing. Doctors and nurses were incredible throughout the whole experience. Um, one nurse, it was amazing, she, uh, gosh, I was very touched by that. One nurse came to me uh, and asked me to pray for her. And uh, I was just able to speak at the time through the trach. And I said, how can I pray for you? And she said, uh, well, my husband's just been given a life sentence. And I'm thinking, here's this nurse looking after me. She's the caregiver, yet her husband has just been in prison for life. And that just was seriously profound, a profound moment in my life. And those three months really have changed me an awful lot in the sense that the power of corporate prayer. Here's the thing. People prayed for me. Thousands of people were praying for me. One occasion, a secretary in the hospital came to see me with a stack, probably two reams of paper, quite frankly. Um, and she handed them to me, and I couldn't hold them. I didn't have the strength. And she put them on my bed. Hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of, of emails uh, that people had emailed the hospital wishing me well. She apologized, she said, I'm sorry, we've run out of color ink, which is, you know, and I said, that doesn't matter, of course, you know, so I wasn't able to read them at the time. But as she was walking out, she stopped and she turned and she said, who are you? And I said, I guess I'm someone who's loved. And that was a real profound moment when you're in a hospital to know people are praying for you. Thousands of people, uh, a member here, Beth Strickland, um, I'd put out uh, emails every day of my condition. And so many people were praying. And I thank you. If you're one of those people, thank you for praying for me. I'm alive because of your prayers. Corporate prayer is very powerful. I'm alive. I'm a living witness to a miracle of, of life. 
because uh, there was a moment when my wife and a couple of people who were there kind of keeping vigil for me, praying, there was a moment when the doctor said, that was it. There's nothing more we can do. Do not expect it. He's not expected to live. The liver had packed up. Uh, the kidneys started to pack up. The organs were starting to pack up. I'd been on 100% oxygen for a long time, and uh, the diagnosis was not good. And they got to the point where the doctors had said they've done all they can. And it was that moment that God stepped in and my healing really started to take place. Very humbling. On top of all that, the <coughs> a friend of mine called um, Andrew White, colloquially known as the Vicar of Baghdad, wrote a book called Suffer the Children. And um, I was at my computer reading an email and, uh, which he had given me before the book came out. And this is what he wrote on the very last page of the book. When an American friend of mine was critically ill recently, it was the children who came and prayed for him every day. Andrew uses children to pray. He goes on to say, and when he was discharged from hospital, we had a party. This, he's writing about Baghdad, children in Baghdad, children in a war-torn city, took time out of their day to pray for me, somebody they'd never met. And to think that children had a party in war-torn Baghdad when I came out of hospital. I was deeply, deeply moved by that. So moved, I really was. Incredible. So this, this whole journey has been very humbling. What do you do after so many people prayed for you? What do you say? How do you live your life? Two things. One is to say thank you all the time. I continually thank God for the gift of life, for the gift of joy, for the gift of the resurrection touch, to thank people who prayed for me. And then the other thing I think that I've learned from this is one of authority. Now, I was involved in the healing ministry for many years um, before I was ordained. Nobody told me as a lay person about the authority we have from God. He says in, uh, Jesus said in Luke 9 2, to his disciples, he said, preach the kingdom and heal the sick. You know? I think the church is doing a pretty good job healing, uh, um, preaching the kingdom. It's, sadly, it's doing a lousy job healing the sick. It's not good. We, we, we need to come back to what Christ taught, some basic stuff that Christ has taught in this ministry. My friend Francis McNutt, for instance, says, you know, people are dying because people aren't praying for them. And I'm a living example of that. I'm alive because people prayed for me. Prayer works. Something always happens when we pray. It's so important that we pray for one another, to believe, to have faith. Something always happens. Please don't doubt God. Please come back to some basics. Perhaps you've prayed before and you feel let down or ignored or even abandoned by God. One of the biggest issues I have in the healing ministry is rejection. So many people think they're rejected when actually they're not. We're deeply loved. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you always. And we need to remember that. So to conclude really is one of utter astonishment. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And when I look back on my life at the times when there was serious questioning as to what I should do and what God is doing and so on and so forth, but to, to stop and look back and reflect and have that opportunity to reflect, to know that God heals, to watch God at work, is amazing. Um, in John it writes that, we must decrease, that he must increase. In other words, that we get out of our way. So many people tell me, I'm a healer, I'm not a healer. They tell me that they're healers. Well, we're not, he is the healer. And it's so important to remember that. Christ is the healer. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that uh, he loves you very much. We forget that love because humans reject us. Humans have been cruel. In my book, I wrote a chapter about the power of the perpetrator. So many people have somebody in life who's hurt them. And we allow them, we rent them space in our brain to have control over us still. And there needs to be a release of that so we can get on with our lives. I wasn't that good at school. I was good at geography and, and music. That was about it. But I've written three books. You know, if my teachers knew that, they'd be astounded. <laughs> Here's the thing. You write a book, you get your thoughts down, an editor edits, that's their job. I love editors, they're fantastic. Editors, doctors and nurses, fantastic. 
So I just want really to summarize in, in, in a, a message of encouragement. If you're going th through stress or strain or disease, keep going, press on. So Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep going. And I like that, just press on, keep going. Pray, get people to pray for you. Set up an internet, uh, on, on the email perhaps, an internet prayer team, that's very powerful. Read books on healing by Francis McNutt, by Jim Glennon, there's, lot, there's a lot of resource. And know that you're not alone, Christ is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you, and he loves you desperately. God bless you.